Don't forget, ko-fi.com slash stop writing alone is a real simple way to show your support for what's going on here week after week. Hi, everyone. This is Nicole Rivera, and this is the Stop Writing Alone podcast for writers who are looking for their writing community. I know you want to find readers for your work, but I think your first step is to connect with other writers. That's what we're going to do here at the Stop Writing Alone podcast. We'll do writing prompts and other writing group activities, discover online writing communities, learn how to find local writing groups, or how to make your own. Join us as we explore, learn, and write. Hi, this is Nicole Rivera, and you're listening to the Stop Writing Alone podcast. So we know I'm all about community. I'm all about story. I'm all about writing. I was pleasantly surprised uh, about a month ago, maybe half a month ago, scrolling through my Facebook, stumbling upon one of my students sharing his um, responses from his own students, because he's a teacher now, uh, an English teacher, about... uh, included in one of their their final projects and as I started reading through their responses I I saw evidence of like this beautiful community that he had built Um, and some interesting conversations about their examination of story and then when I started to talk to him I learned a little bit about some of the writing he's been doing with his students. So I jokingly said to him, you know, if we continue this conversation, I'm just going to have to have you on my podcast. And he's like, oh, I wouldn't mind. So here we are. (laughs) Episode 74 is uh, me talking and catching up with one of my students who's now a teacher, but really taking a look at all of the, the super cool things that he's been doing in his high school English class. And believe it or not, I think there's a lot that is relevant to what we can be doing as writers. And for all you YA writers out there, there's a lot of juicy uh, teenagery talk in here that you're going to want to take note of and just sort of immerse yourself for a moment in this uh, this wonderful world of sophomore English. So here we go. Enjoy uh, Mike Maresca. Hey, hey, everybody. It's Nicole, and I am here with Mike Maresca. Mike and I go way, way back into my other lifetime of being a teacher. Mike is a former student of mine, but now has taken on the glorious role of teacher himself. This is your second year, and you're over in um, LaGuardia. Right now, I'm at LaGuardia. Yeah, it's been an amazing experience. Love my kids there. A lot of creativity. I was just going to say, for anyone that doesn't sort of know what that name means, the way that we kind of know here in New York, can you can you give like a little synopsis of like what LaGuardia is? Sure. So uh, Fiorello LaGuardia is a high school, which if you've ever heard of or seen the movie Fame, mm-hmm. Fame is actually based on LaGuardia. It's a specialized high school. It features performing arts. That's the real specialty. Students have to audition to get in. They can have different focuses of studies. You can be an art major, a music major, a drama major, a dancer. In addition to all that, there is still a rigorous academic instruction that goes along with the performing arts. And the students have to, they're screened, so they have to take a specialized high school exam as well to get into LaGuardia. There are only nine schools in New York City that have to take that. And LaGuardia is considered one of the top four, along with Bronx Science, Stuyvesant, and I believe Brooklyn Tech. Right, right, yeah. It's 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 quite something. And when you when you got the gig over there, I was like, well, that makes sense because Mike's a music guy. <laughs> yeah. So your school year is coming to an end, but you've done some pretty amazing things with your kids this year. Um, that I've sort of been, uh, I guess, Facebook stalking the. You've, you've been fangirling about. I have. I have. <laughs> I. If people are going to love on story, I'm going to love on them. So uh, I don't know. Where do we want to begin? Like, what is you've you've talked to me a little bit about some cool and torturous writing practices that you've been doing with your students. But also we've talked about, like, how you examine story with your students. 
So I, I and, and by the way, this all happened. I should just say to the audience, this all happened because Mike also uh, presented to his students what t- give everybody what was their final project that they had to do. This is what perked my ears up. <laughs> Uh, the final project was that they had to create a podcast. But so I wanted to still see some of the skills that we had learned throughout the year. So they had to do a podcast and some of the writing things I've done that I'll discuss later go through a similar mentality. Okay, you have this podcast. I'll give you some guiding questions to get you started. You're running to see these skills. So, you know, you can choose which ones you're best at, but I want to see imagery at some point. You know, I want to see you if you're choosing the writing option. I want to see you using semicolons properly. I want to see you do these certain things. And so I would set them out with a challenge of sorts, but with the freedom to do it as they pleased, as long as they demonstrated those skills. One of the great and funny things that happened uh, was that, you know, as the students were responding to things, they said that, you know, with my class, they feel that the community we created within our classes and, you know, just the way I've treated them, they were like, no, you know what? Like I have to, I have to do Maruska's work and I want to, because it's something that, It's going to make me think it's something that isn't going to be too hard. It might challenge me, but like, I'll actually be using my brain for a bit and I want to do his work. I mean, it's a huge compliment, you know, it's, it's immense. And, and really our, our conversation around this started when you shared some of their responses, your question was like, did, did you use psychology on them during the year? And, and of course, some of them, I mean, you could see the, the, the honor student humor and, and everything that they were really like (laughs) nailing some, some fun little sarcastic things there. And I loved it. But the, um, that community that you built was dripping and evident on everything and I was just so um impressed by that and I think because I'm I'm going to be the person that always drives the message home what's it what was interesting to me to see that and I've had senses of this from my time of teaching is that that desire for community um and what it does for our work ethic and everything has always been there you know and that and your kids kind of showed it to me because it was it was there that it was in that assignment that a couple of kids said, you're the teacher I keep showing up for because this is the place where I feel heard. This is, you know, like where we are, we're connecting. And I was like, there it is again. Like if you find the right community and if you build that, um, you're going to show up more and you're going to want to show up. It's not going to be like, I have to do this thing. It's going to be, I can't wait to see what these people think about the next project I do. So Absolutely. it was a really, really beautiful thing. I, I, I'm so happy that you have all of those responses like in text and saved somewhere that, that you can take with you forever because you, you did an amazing job. And that's, I can see that from, from those responses alone. It was really, really great stuff. And yeah, it was definitely, it was great to see those responses. And right. like you said, it's not, you know, it's not the community I create. And I said this in a message to my students, you know, I I had like a end of year, so long message. And it was, you know, exactly that was, listen, I created the space for it, but you created it. It was what you made it Mm -hmm. to be. And that got deeper, the more you got invested into it. Every time. Mm -hmm. I think a teacher's job or a group leader's job is always to just create a safe space. As long as you can create a safe space where people can show up and truly be themselves without judgment or, you know, just like be comfortable in their own skin, then the community builds itself within, you know, but somebody has got to just say like ground rules we're all awesome for being here and that's it. You know, like that's, it's the only Absolutely. requirement. And it's, it's, it's strange how rare that is, you know, that that's not happening everywhere. Yeah. When I came into LaGuardia and I didn't actually, you know, start there until October, which, you know, New York city, the school year starts beginning of September. So, I mean, this is a month in and it, it's a difficult position, you know, and it's, it's tough because, you know, some of the kids had gotten used to some things you know, they had practices in place and now they have to have this change. And, you know, so from the get-go, it was going to be difficult just because I had to figure out where they were yeah. and assess them. It was an interesting period trying to feel them out and trying to see what was a fair challenge for them, what they would respond to, and trying to do that without falling too far behind since it already was October, you know? Yeah. And the the first book that we decided to do was Frankenstein. It's the first story I'm going to do with them. 
Right. Um, and so I'm going to run you through like how we started that and how it gets to, because this is where, you know, the psychological thing that we talked about before came in. So that's why I feel right. like this is a good place to start too, is, you know, right at the very beginning. Before starting a book, before anything, and this is actually, funnily enough, something I realized as a student in your class all those years ago now, that a really good way to, you know, get people about what you're going to do Just next. Just a reminder for the audience, I taught math. <laughs> And it's applying to English. I'm getting goosebumps. Go ahead, go. <laughs> so it's a teacher practice. I mean, listen, I've been a student for a while. You know, I'm a teacher for a little while too. And right. I, for a very long time, thought that just do now is when you come in, we're busy work. Well, everybody got situated. I didn't think they really had a purpose. <laughs> and in your class, I started to realize that whatever the do now was, was leading into that day. And I remember outright saying to you one day, like, oh my God, you're doing it. I was always going to the lesson. And you just shot me this dumbfounded look, like, what did you think they were supposed to do? And right. I just looked you in the eye and shrugged my shoulders and said, I thought they were just to keep us busy for a few minutes. Right. <laughs> and then it's something that I started to pay attention to in all of my classes. And it's something that when I became a teacher, I wanted to use in my own pedagogy because it works and because it is great to yeah. get you thinking in that way so that it's not just out of the blue. It's not off the bat. It's okay. I've been thinking here. Now we're taking a next step. Now we're going to build mm -hmm. up one more step after that. And it's a gradual process. Absolutely. And I try to have that same kind of approach when it comes to books, you know? So before right. we even started reading Frankenstein, I gave my kids a creative writing prompt. Oh, nice. And, and I said, you know, like if you were going to create the ideal human, like what would your ideal human be? Hmm. And I was expecting a lot of, well, what would you say if I said, you know, create your perfect human being? Oh, what well, do you think your perfect human being would be? It's funny because I'm not thinking of anything physical, right? And so, and, and knowing that we're, it's, this, is, this is hard because I know we're going to Frankenstein. Frankenstein feels like a very physical yeah. sort of situation that we're creating this body and everything. And yeah, it's, it's like, I'm thinking that I want to create the things that are uncreatable. Like I want, I want just like someone that's, you know, funny and, and yeah, themselves, yeah. <laughs> but you're yeah, asking no. me to decide what themselves is. And that's, <laughs> that's not an easy It's answer. funny because that's exactly the response that they gave pretty much. And actually some of the responses really surprised me. I was expecting, you know, because I mean, again, wow. you know, we kind of know this, we know what Frankenstein is. When I asked this, I was expecting like right. he's going to be like Superman and he's going to have superpowers and be incredibly mm. smart. Um, yeah. And a lot of these students, instead, they were focused on the emotional side. And they said, you know, I want somebody who would be able to understand people in different situations and act as a mediator. Somebody who would be able to bring people together and say, we don't need to fight over this. You know, somebody who would you know, kind of spread that peace and love, but like in a logical way, somebody who would be able to take pain if it meant taking pain away from others. I mean, these are 15 yeah. year old kids, oh, wow. you know, so to see that, like, no, yeah, I mean, these are sophomores. I never, I never underestimate after 10 years of being with teenagers, I'm no longer surprised. Teenagers are amazing, amazing like human beings and they, they, there's just so much in there that uh, yeah that's that's beautiful that that was their first thing because yeah, yeah there's also that the the uh the hilarity of of um hormones that could have taken that assignment in a different way <laughs> <laughs> oh there is i have an actual perfect example of kind of hilarity of hormone <laughs> and this is this is one of my favorite things this is one of those things, you know, as a teacher, you have a lot of students. And there are certain things that, like, you know, you kind of don't notice kids until one thing happens, right? And then once they do, that's, you just always associate that with them, yes. right? So when, yes. when they created these, you know, I, uh, I collected them and I read them. And for context, I had one of my classes this year I referred to as the girl class. The reason I referred to them as the girl class okay. is because out of 34 students, Two of them were male. Oh my god! Oh yeah, my god. and and I was just like, like, just how does that happen? Not that I have a problem with it, but I was just like, you know, like just statistically, like yeah. that's wild to have thirty-four students and thirty-two females. So, I have this one girl. She is a dancer. 
when coming up with how to create the perfect human, she decided that she would create a machine that would build the perfect boyfriend. Okay. And then she would let her friends use it <laughs> to create their perfect boyfriends so they would all be happy. And I then coined the phrase, build a bay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So instead of build a bear, it. yeah, this girl was inventing build a bay. And then she would use that through like several other creative writing prompts throughout the year. It was just like, yeah, you know the money I'm making from build a bay? I'm going <laughs> to... Just drop it in. <laughs> and it, it was fantastic. So there was that bit of teenagerness too. Okay. Yes, <laughs> Which is, I, I love that. It's great. Once we started the text, one of the things that I wanted them to consider was, you know, like, what is the human experience? What does it mean to be human? What is humanity? And it was this philosophical aspect that took them all for surprise because they were like, you know, this guy's been here two, three weeks and we're getting like, this is a, some heavy stuff. And this is not usual English class stuff. Yeah. The amount of times I heard this year, this is not usual English class stuff was... Mm -hmm. And so I try to structure my class more like a college course. We do a lot of talking, a lot of open-ended stuff. And at first, my students have a hard time with that because it's not what they're used to and because they want there to be a right answer. Yeah. I mean, especially at sophomores, that's a, you know, yeah. that's yeah. a new, brand new experience for them. Yeah. And, you know, so they would keep booking me for the answers. And I'd be like, I don't, I don't have an answer. Like, I don't. I, I want to know what your answer is. I don't want you to just think that whatever I say is right, because it might not be. Right. The important thing is how you defend what you believe in. Because eventually, and you're going to have to do this in essays, you're going to do this in life, you're going to have to make an argument and defend it. And how you defend that is going to be what matters. It's not going to matter like what you say. There is no right answer. There is no right side. It's whatever you think right is. Right. You know, and it, it's something that as the year went on, that kind of mentality is what helped us to really create that sense of community because then the students were able to, we did a lot of talking in class. We did a lot of talking. We talked every day as a whole class and yeah. just yeah. being able to get the opinions of other people and to see that, you know what, it's not, there is no wrong answer because if there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. It's how you defend yourself. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so that helped to really build the confidence of the students and create that sense of community. But we started talking about these things and we that. said, you know, like, what is humanity? Is the creature human? You know, like, how do you define that? What is the human experience? And throughout studying that and throughout considering some of those things, one of the lessons that we had done, and this was something that I thought would be great for characterization, it's something I was a bit apprehensive about, I've always been a fan of psychology. I'm a fan of, you know, philosophy, thinking outside the box, really examining things in different ways. And one of the things that I wanted to try with them was for homework. I asked my students to go home and take a MBTI quiz, Meyer-Briggs type indicator. You know, it's a quick personality quiz. Yep. And at the end, it assigns you four letters and that's your type of character. That's who you are. So, for example, I am an ENTJ, I'm extroverted, you know, I'm very logical, I'm a leader, I know how to be creative and think outside the box, but I'm pretty bossy, which is what teachers kind of need to be. I am an INFP. Yes, yes, that is definitely you. And you, you are, you are, what are you? An E, what was it? ENTJ. So we're like exactly so the, the only thing we have oh. is our N. We have our N's. Yeah, I, th I think it's intuitive. <laughs> yeah. Yes, oh, yes, boy. definitely. <laughs> so what I did was I had them go take these quizzes and I said, listen, you don't have to write anything down. You don't have to, you know, just come in knowing what you are and knowing a little bit about that. Like, what does that say about you? What are the traits of that kind of person? And, you know, the next day they come in yeah. and they were excited about it. And it was really cool to kind of share around and go through the different kinds of people people were. And, you know, like, oh, my God, I can't believe this, you know, this described me so well. And it was really great to see them kind of being self-reflective like that. And because a lot of them admitted that they enjoyed it. Right. So they were really excited at the opportunity to just kind of reflect on themselves and to see that. And then to see, you know, where their classmates were and to see, like, how they worked together with each other. 
it was also really, really amusing um, to kind of see what stereotypes there were because, you know, I'm at a performing arts school again. So you figure a lot of the mm. art majors, they're quiet. They're going to be introverted. You know, the musicians, the drama people, they're loud. So they're, most of them are extrovert. So it was really amusing when like the one art kid was an extrovert and everybody was like, what? How are you an extrovert? You're an art major. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and that was just, it was such a teenager now. thing. Yeah. And it was such a teenager thing, but it was right. great. And so after, you know, we had gotten this bit out, I had uh, several different post-it colors, right? And I decided I was going to split them up into groups based on what their initial two letters are. So let's say like INs, the two, like if it was INTP or INFP, they might have been like a pink post-it. If you were, you know, ENFP or EN whatever, you got a yellow post-it, so on and so forth. Then I wanted them to try to get into groups of four with at least one of each post-it color. And if you, you couldn't find somebody with all post-it colors, you know, like then you could double up, but you had to actually try to actively, you know, have one of each in your group. And the reason I did that as a teacher was because I wanted to see the extroverts and the introverts work together yeah. because one, they could help each other understand each other, you know, and as a teacher, if you have a group of talkative extroverts, they're going to get off topic and they're going to BS and they're going to do all the work in the last 30 seconds. And the introverts yep. are going to be really quiet and not know where to start. And th there's nothing wrong with that. That is absolutely fine. You know, like I understand that. I understand the stress, the mentality, the anxiety. I get it. But I wanted them to kind of help each other out. And so I thought grouping in that way would really help them to, one, actually keep things moving. But, you know, two, to kind of help them understand each other better and, you know, to have that opportunity to express themselves. And when they were in the groups, what I then asked them to do, which they were all surprised but excited for, I asked them to examine the characters in Frankenstein through an MBTI lens. I said, okay, if, you know, these characters, it was Victor, the creature, I think Robert Walton, and it was, you know, if these characters were real people, what do you think their MBTI would be? So I had them look at, like, just the letters, and I had put, you know, what the letters were in the slide. So it was like, E is extrovert, I is introvert. Break it down. Like, you know, just go step by step through each of the letters. Do you think this person is introverted? Okay. Do you think they're extroverted? Do you think they're intuitive? Do you think they're whatever? You know, so they would have to go through the letters, you know, like a combination lock, essentially, and decide together where it would fall into. And Love it. Yeah, no, and it was great. And they got really excited about it. And they actually got excited about it in all the ways I was worried they wouldn't. And they really jumped at the challenge to get inside the characters' heads. Because that's what it is. It's not just understanding what they look like. It's not just understanding basic motivations. You know, Victor wanted to create the creature so that he could bring his mother back to life. You know, he wanted to do these things for science. It's not that. That is very surface level. This is how does he think? He, you know, what what is he at his core? What is his personality? And you know, it's a much deeper level to get to. The students loved it. The most interesting thing about it to me was when it came to the creature, there was a huge debate on whether he was an introvert or extrovert. And the argument was, well, you know, there was this time where he lived, you know, in the cabin or whatever, the barn, and he hid away. So he's an introvert because he didn't come out to people. He just stayed inside the whole time. He didn't interact with anybody. You know, he's clearly an introvert. And then there always became the argument of, but that's not what he wants. He wants to be outside talking people he wants to interact with the other humans but he knows it's not in his best interest he knows it's not safe if he does that so if he were to take the test he would be an extrovert because the way he'd answer the questions would be that he does want to interact with people so since he does want that and that is you know that is his mind that is his heart that's where he is he should be an extrovert not an introvert right coming to that and getting that inside the head it. was amazing the most amusing part and just the most fantastic part was that the students who thought the creature was introverted were students who were extroverted. Oh. The students who were introverted were the ones that saw that, no, he's an extrovert. And they did it based on their own judgments because the extroverts would want to be outside. 
So when they see him sitting inside, they're not thinking about the mentality. They're looking at the surface level of it, of he stays inside. He must not want to go out and make friends. He's an introvert. Whereas the introverts who understand that anxiety, and stress, and what it means to put yourself out there and that fear of rejection and a fear of not being accepted, you know, they understand that. They understand what it actually is to be introverted. And it was amazing to see them say that it would be the opposite of them. <laughs> oh, wow. I love yeah. it. Yeah. So then from analyzing like that, when it came to other writing and creative writing things, I said, you know, how can you do this with your own characters? When you create new characters, and you know, this is coming back to <laughs> what we're talking about right now, you and I. When you create characters, how do you get inside their head? How can you use something psychological like that to build on and to create your characters around? And right. how much do you take that into account? Because there is something much different than, you know, just saying, oh, well, this person's angry and they want revenge. You know, it's another thing to like really get inside their heads and to think about, even if you don't write it out, how the actions and thoughts in their head affect the entire story. It's something that I've thought about in my writing, you know, and it's led to some pretty interesting choices. Um, and it's something that I really think more people should consider. Have you ever done anything like that where you really tried to think about, you know, the character as an actual person and how their thoughts would, you know, create them or create the entire scene around them? So I am pretty much like a pantser, a discovery writer. Uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. So I usually sit down with, I'm, I'm very plot driven in my first draft every time. I can't not be. So I'm very plot driven. So it's usually in revisions where that, that exact internal conversation happens because I take a look at the evidence of what happened on the page in my first draft and how this person reacted to things that happened. And now I have to like rewrite for this to be like a fully fleshed out person and say, okay, so based mm. on this and this and this, um, it looks like, uh, you know, he's, he's a little bit more extroverted. And, and so then if I pull in another scenario, this is how he would act. And that's that um, sense. I don't, you know, I don't think I would necessarily use the word extroverted, but it's basically like based on the way it felt like he should react that in that first draft, if I give this scenario, then that's how he's going to act here. Um, yeah. I basically oh. meet my characters on the page. I'm not, and, and it's fascinating to me when I um, talk to a writer who's the opposite, who, who like comes to the page with a fully fleshed out sort of idea of a person and then is trying to figure out what will happen with them, like try to figure out the plot. Hmm. I'm the opposite. I have a, a story idea, a thing that's going to happen, and then I need my people to sort of go through it. Um, okay. But but I believe whether you're, it's kind of like the the um, the pantser plotter debate. Do you discovery write or do you outline before? I believe this type of thinking about the the depths of the personality of your character has to happen at some point and it's just a question of do you do it before you begin or is it something that you do you know later on once you have yeah. a little bit of information but i it, it would be very hard to to have a a deep character without um thinking in this realm I just love this idea of applying, you know, like you're right, there's some science here to yeah. how we can discuss um, these these depths. So why not use them? Why not think oh, about totally. these four letters and, and how, how they translate? Because maybe if I'm struggling with a particular character, it's because I haven't, you know, I forgot to think about the end part, you know, <laughs> and, and, Absolutely. and that's really not shown on my page and something I need to go back to. So yeah, in a way I can say yes to this depth. I'm not sure that I've, I've really, um, I've done the work, you know? So I once had this crazy concept for a zombie story, right? Okay. The very atypical zombie story. And I'm going to tell you how the psychology of one specific character would change the entire story. Okay. So my premise for a zombie story, uh, it starts out, you know, the U S military is researching bioweapons. 
yes, we've agreed to stop, but it's still going on under the table. We're just not talking about it. At this one facility, uh, there's this general, and he is trying to create a new, you know, super bioweapon. So he decides to try mixing different viruses together. You know, what happens if you mix yellow fever and Ebola? Do you get a more powerful virus? Do you get, you know, does one dominate the other and kill the other? You know, what's going to happen? And through this, like, kind of experimentation process, they find this one combination that, instead of being destructive, winds up being, like, this miracle drug that completely regenerates tissue, you know, takes care of cancer, the common cold. It's a cure-all for everything. And then at some point, somehow, the U.S. people get their hands on this, it's spread out. Eventually, you find out that people just start waking up at wakes. And, you know, there are bodies and morgues that just come back to life. And everybody freaks out. Then they realize that it's this, you know, super drug, this wonder cure. And it's what's actually bringing people back to life. Now, there is a huge social dilemma. Because are these people actually dead? Did they die? Do we need to redefine what death is? Are they still citizens? Are they still entitled to benefits? Are they still married? Are they still residents? How do we determine labor laws for people like this? If you can die and come back to life, do we still need to have the same rules and regulations that we do now? Are they accepted by society? Right. Are there people who think that these people are an abomination, that you know, they shouldn't be coming back to life? And this whole, you know, societal impact of what their rights are and who they are would come to a boiling point. But mm -hmm. the issue of, let's say, like a civil war would be, let's say there is a war that breaks out between the people who have not yet died and the people who have died and come back to life. What happens if you are a soldier or somebody on the side that hasn't died and you died in the battle? Are you welcome back to the group you were just fighting for? No, because you're no longer one of them. But are you accepted by the people you were just fighting against because now you are? Or are you still the enemy? And we just create all of these like really interesting social aspects right. of, you know, like not your typical zombie stuff because when people come back, they would have their full brains intact. Like they would still be them. It's not like they're just right. mindless husks because, you know, this thing cures everything and it regenerates their cells. The most important thing to this story and something that I really had to sit down and think about because it was going to change the way the entire plot goes. So I have that out. You know, that's my, okay, this is what I think is going to happen. There is one very specific, very important turning point. And that is, how does the president react? And to think about this, I had to say, well, you know, America, we have two major political parties. How would a Democratic president react versus a Republican president? You know, how would they take this information you know, would a Democratic president wait until they had more information before giving it out to everybody? You know, would a Republican president just rush it through? Would they not care about the safety? Would they just, you know, and it was really interesting to kind of go down this, okay, well, you know, even within that, if they're going to be a Republican, what state would they be from? They're going to be a Democrat. Where would they probably be from? What would their values be mm -hmm. as that type of politician? And it was really fascinating to try to actually stop and think how much of a difference that could make to the entire plot of the story when it's a pretty, you know, early on thing. It's a pretty insignificant thing. You know, I mean, you don't need the president to be a major person. You just need him to give, you know, this right. little bit of how it's going to happen. And what I ultimately went with, which I thought was very plausible, was I had a Republican president from Texas who wore a bolo tie. And, you know, he had this very, like, no-nonsense kind of attitude. And he was up for re-election. So he decided that if he pushed this out to the people, even though it wasn't, really, like, really ready yet, that it would win him the re-election. And it did. And he wins in a landslide. And that's how everybody gets inoculated with this and why people don't know that it could potentially bring them back from the dead. And that's, right, you know, that's a, right. it's an instance of, like, you really think about it, and it's not that big of a deal, but it makes a big difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I I went to a, a workshop. Um, oh, my God. It was only a year ago. <laughs> I went to a workshop <laughs> a year ago on uh, sci-fi and yeah, yeah it's ridiculous. Sci-fi and fantasy um, writing. And really, we got into the to the weeds talking about world building and stuff. And, and she really like pulled out the whole like 
think about the rules, think about who makes the rules, think about, uh, you know, like, what's the economy? What's how? (laughs) So we just talked about the simplicity of like, you make a world where people can fly. Okay. So now what do buildings look like? What do streets look like? What does, and it was just like, yes, oh, yes, that's how these worlds are so deep because it's just like everything gets flipped with this little thing. And that's, that's what that, uh, that conversation reminds me of because um, I've, you know, I've always been, you know, a fan of sci-fi and fantasy and think like, wow, these people really thought of everything so um believable who thinks of this and it's like oh no you realize that there is a thing in your world that's different than ours and how does how would the world react to that you have to just like step into those shoes and it's it's uh it's amazing and you're right you know in our country politics is is basically a a, a shorthand personality test lately so <laughs> it, it it could be uh very interesting stuff so before we we wrap you were telling me before we got started about a writing practice that you did with your students that sounded a little a little fun and a little torture um what what was it yeah I, absolutely I, you. I said save it for the podcast <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely uh so another thing that i like to do i like to use a lot of creative writing in my classroom because i when we need to analyze reading you know which is what the students are going to be asked to do one of the ways that i feel is best to ingrain that is rather than reading and identifying it is trying to use it in your writing because if you can use it successfully in your writing you can identify it when other writers use it. So what I would do, because the students, you know, I need to get them ready for writing. They're going to take AP exams and SATs and regions where they need to just write for two hours straight. So I really built up their stamina and I would give them different challenges that would kind of keep them motivated and not just be, okay, write for 20 minutes. So I developed this sort of challenge test practice that I adapted in various ways throughout the year. But it would take up an entire period, which would be about 45 minutes. And what I would do is I would allow them to free write for, let's say, seven minutes. And I would have a timer that would go off after seven minutes. But there would be certain criteria they would have to meet. So they could write about anything they wanted, but it had to have three semicolons in it. And it had to have one Oxford comma. And it had to have four examples of imagery. Right, something like that, because those were things that we had worked on, things that I wanted to see they understood. And, you know, it's something that kind of sounds silly when you think about it, but then when you actually sit down to write about it, it's like, well, well, where do I want the imagery to go? Like, what is the best way to use a semicolon in this? You know? And it provided this really interesting challenge that the students enjoyed. And instead of being like, oh, God, I don't want to do this, they were like, wait, what? How, how, what? What? No one's ever asked me to do this before. Right. You know, how can I write whatever I want, but, but not write whatever I want. It was really, really interesting. Yes. Yeah. I would, I would be the one that would argue and say, Mr. You, are, this is not a free, write. There's nothing free about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but yeah. Too bad. You have to write it anyway. You put the shackles on. <laughs> I have. Exactly. And another thing, another way that I adopted this throughout the year that made it a lot tougher even, but more interesting was I would give them an option of three prompts to start with. Right. So you could pick prompt A, prompt B, prompt C. No matter what you picked, you had to have these certain criteria, right? And then the seven minutes would go off. Okay. Next slide would be another prompt, another set of three prompts with new criteria, right? And it could be a completely different story. It didn't have to go together. That was fine. You know, completely different, whatever. You have another seven minutes. Go for it. This time you have to have no contractions, which always threw them for a loop. Um, you know, like you have to limit the number of prepositions you use or something crazy like that. Seven minutes. Okay, mm-hmm. go. After seven minutes, yep. one more round. Okay, another three prompts. Here are, you know, another set of challenges. These are the things you have to meet. Okay, seven minutes, go. Boom, seven minutes up. Now, here's the hard part. Now, I want you to spend the last seven minutes of class going back, picking out at least one sentence from each of the other three writings to turn into a story. I don't care how you fit them together. Mm. I don't care what it's about, but I want to see one sentence from each of those 
in your final fourth paragraph. And it was really interesting. It was something they enjoyed the challenge of because it got them thinking. And because a lot of them said afterwards, you know, I never realized how many contractions I use until I had to stop myself from using contractions. You know, like I never realized what right. the purpose of semicolon was until it was like, crap, how, how do I do this? Yeah, how do I fit it away? And it's something that I think, you know, writers of any level can benefit from. Because there are things that, I mean, listen, you're a writer, you know, you fall into certain things that you like and you use that a lot. And then yep. you forget certain other skills. Absolutely. I write a lot of poetry. I write a lot of song lyrics. I use a lot of breath commas mm -hmm. that when you write a short story or you know something in a different format that has a different function, you can't use commas as freely and as openly because it throws off sentences. That's not the way sentences are structured. And so I feel like any writer of right. any skill level of any age can do an exercise like that and say, okay, I'm going to challenge myself to better myself in these tools. And, you know, so I'm going to try to use these three things. And you focus on it a little bit at a time. You know, you don't go for 19 things. You go for one thing. Yeah. And you see no, how I, that works out. I definitely love this. There's, there's, a. Uh, it kind of reminds me, one of, one of my favorite uh, writing prompts that I do uh, is called The Sticks, which I only recently realized does harken back to something from my teaching with popsicle sticks. I was like, <laughs> why are popsicle sticks always in my life? Um, but I have, uh, it's from the writer's toolbox by Jamie Cat Callen, and she provides three bundles of popsicle sticks. And one is filled with first sentences. Uh, the second bundle is non sequiturs and the third yep, bundle I think I know is what you're last about. straw. Yeah. And yeah, so it's similar to what, what you're doing here. You would pick a first sentence and set the timer for around like six, seven minutes and write. And then you pick the second sentence, the non sequitur. And that different from what you guys are doing, that does have to come into your story. And you just have to like run with it and make it work. You get another seven minutes to get that bad boy in there somehow. And then mm -hmm. when seven minutes are up, you get the last straw and then that has to come in. It, it never fails that when I do this with a writing group, like everyone is um, sort of charged up and feeling great um, because it's the first time that they have stopped their writing like that and, and had to think on their feet in such a quick way. So your exercise mm -hmm. is very reminiscent of that, that each seven minute burst has these challenges that are things that, oh, I didn't know that was coming. I have to do that now. And I love this idea at the end of pulling out the sentences from the first three to try and create something new. So this was really, really wonderful, Mike. I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time in June. Teachers yeah, thanks for are, having me. are hard to come yeah. by. But um, yeah, is there anything else you'd like to share with the Stop Writing Loan community before we, we sign off here? Uh, I think, you know, just don't get discouraged. Don't be afraid to try things. You know, keep at it. There's going to be times when you write stuff and it sucks. There's going to be times where you come back a month later and the thing that sucked is something you now love. So, you know, always save whatever you write, no matter how good or how bad, because, you know, it depends on the mood you're in. And some days the mood you're in, you're going to look at that like anything else. You're going to wish you threw it away, but eventually you're going to find it. You're going to come back. Maybe it's a month later. Maybe it's a year later. I don't know. But you scroll through and you say, what's this? And then you realize, wow, that's great. And why why did I want to throw this out? So just make sure, you know, like, don't be afraid to write. Anytime something comes to you, even if it's just a sentence, even if it's just a rhyme or a line or a phrase, write it down. Because later on, it may be something really big. Don't think that anything is too small and that anything is unimportant. So true. I have loads of old notebooks and I open them up and I'm like, who wrote this? Oh, <laughs> that's my handwriting. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember yeah. that. All right, Mike. Yeah. And you know what? I'm realizing we didn't even touch the surface of songwriting. We definitely need to have that discussion someday. So, I Oh, my God. I'd love to. Just I'm say when. Torturing you again soon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thank right. you. Thanks again. for having me. Ciao. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe to the Stop Writing Alone podcast wherever you're listening to this episode today. Then connect with us on Facebook at Stop Writing Alone Facebook page or in the Stop Writing Alone with Nicole Rivera Facebook group. 
check Instagram or Twitter where I'm at NV underscore Rivera to find links to our email newsletter. Happy writing. See you next week.